Um, hello, I am Dr. Rajiv Parikh. I'm the chairman of Vascular and Endovascular Sciences at the Medanta Medicity Hospital in Gurgaon in Delhi. Um, we have been involved for the last 10 years at this hospital, prior to which I was working in a city hospital in Delhi for the last almost 21 years. So, and essentially dealing with peripheral vascular diseases. Today, I'm going to talk about the diseases affecting the veins, primarily affecting the veins. And one of the most common diseases affecting the veins is a clotting which develops inside these veins. Clotting or deep vein thrombosis is a very serious problem because once it develops, it can actually undergo a very fatal transformation and the patients can actually die because of a pulmonary embolism. Deep vein thrombosis has, there are many reasons, many causes why deep vein thrombosis would develop. It is fairly common amongst the younger generation. Today, people who are sitting for long periods of time, sitting and working on computers or on their desk jobs for long periods of time, can develop venous stasis, which means that the blood actually collects and stagnates in the legs. And this can, over a period of time, clot. And once the clot develops, this clot can then travel up into the lungs, giving rise to pulmonary embolism. And if it is a large enough clot, this clot can actually block off the lungs and the person can actually die. Time and again, we see patients in the hospital who are coming in for an operation, lying in bed for a, five, you know, for a few days and ready to be home the next day, get up in the morning, get ready to change and get ready to leave and they suddenly take one deep breath, have a sudden difficulty in breathing, they choke and they actually die right there and then. This is because of a sudden pulmonary embolism or a clot which has gone into the lungs, which has actually blocked off their lungs and their blood supply. So this is deep pain thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, which is a fatal complication of the clot in the legs. There are a variety of reasons why clotting develops. One, as I said, was just sitting on a stationary job. Long periods of flying. These days, all of us are flying all over the world. We are taking long distance flights. The longest flight which is undertaken recently was one from, uh, from London to, to, to Sydney. And, uh, and sorry, New York to Sydney. I think it took almost about 20 hours, 20 hours of flying. And this is probably going to be one of the biggest reasons why in the modern day and age, people will develop leg clots because sitting for a long period of time in a cramped up position can actually cause stagnation of blood and giving rise to deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. There are of course other reasons. That means that there are some intrinsic reasons. The patient's blood supply or blood actually has some characteristics which predisposes it to clot. This blood, when it becomes thick, it has a tendency to clot. So after or during any operation which has resulted in a post-operative period stay in the hospital for over, you know, uh, for about three to five days or any medical illness in which the patient is just lying up in bed, high fever, loose motions, diarrhea, dysentery, vomiting, nausea, anything which makes you lie in bed for a period of time can actually make your blood become thick and hyperviscosity can actually lead to blood clotting. So this is again another reason or factor why blood clotting could occur. So deep pain thrombosis actually once it develops, obviously in every everyone who develops deep pain thrombosis doesn't die because of a pulmonary embolism. Most of the patients would actually continue to live without a problem, except that over a period of time, they start developing swelling in the legs. The leg swelling gets worse when they stand, sit or work with their legs in their dependent position. And this actually then worsens over a period of three, five, 10 years. And the leg swelling then gradually, progressively increases. And then the skin changes start to occur. And then the skin actually implodes from within. That means the skin actually ruptures and people form ulcers. So this is called the post-thrombotic syndrome, which actually results in ulcers, which are venous ulcers or um, um, you know, post-thrombotic ulcers, which patients develop. 
this is again a difficult situation to treat but of course it is all manageable there are medical managements there are very good medical therapies if the diagnosis of deep vein thrombosis is made the diagnosis is made very simply by a few blood tests you can actually get a hemogram a hemoglobin test to find out if there is any hyperviscosity you can get their cholesterol levels tested you can then get a doppler a venous doppler test done for the legs this can actually tell us and show us where exactly the first of all whether there is a thrombus or not and if there is a thrombus where exactly it is and how long uh, is the thrombus and where all is the extension so once that is known one can actually go about treating this if the thrombus is in the iliac vein which is intra abdominal as you know this thrombus can actually if it is symptomatic and the patient is having severe symptoms this thrombus can actually be dissolved and this dissolution can be uh, can be done performed by introducing a needle and through which a catheter is passed from the back of the knee all the way up into the inferior vena cava and a thrombolytic agent such as actylize which is tpa which is tissue plasminogen activator or urokinase can be injected at a continuous rate through a syringe infusion pump and this dissolution or this dissolving the thrombus procedure which is called catheter directed thrombolysis can be done once the catheter directed thrombolysis has been done for 24 36 hours the whole area actually completely opens up if it doesn't open up then there are certain mechanisms certain catheters certain machines which cause pharmacomechanical thrombo, thrombo uh, endarterectomy which means that the clot is actually macerated turned up and then aspirated or sucked out through a suction machine into a container and thereby clearing up the thrombus once the thrombus opens up then if there is still a persistent narrowing if the vein is actually still constricted and still getting compressed then we can actually put in a stent and these special stents can actually be inserted into the iliac vein which can then keep the vein open and prevent any further pressure down onto the legs so this will reduce the incidence or chances of swelling in the legs after deep vein thrombosis and of course the subsequent development of ulcers and other problems which would develop after uh, an episode like this so these patients the initial primary management would be to first to diagnose them on the basis of the presentation confirm the diagnosis with a well performed venous doppler examination and then medical management is the mainstay or the backbone of medical of 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 treatment of deep vein thrombosis and that includes anticoagulation when we say anticoagulation you can start off with the injectable form of anticoagulants which is low molecular weight heparin there are 3 4 of them in the market there is doltiparin there is inoxaparin there is fondaparinux and and um, uh, other 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 fraxiparin and these these uh, low molecular weight heparins can be given over a period of time to re uh, to to reduce the uh, extension of thrombus and to prevent further thrombosis from occurring these then have to be followed up with oral anticoagulation you all know and are probably aware of the rat poison which was used which has been used for the last 50 years which is warfarin now we are increasingly using the newer oral anticoagulants which have been in the market there are three of them which are readily available one is rivaroxaban the other is apixaban and the third is davigatran these three oral anticoagulants the newer oral anticoagulants can be used with very very good resolution of symptoms and uh, at 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 a very low incidence of complications such as bleeding and these patients can actually do not require any form of monitoring so warfarin or acetrom which used to be uh, prescribed before as an anticoagulant required repeated um, uh, you know ch checks with with uh, uh, inr and uh, prothrombin time but with neuroral anticoagulants none of this is required and these patients can be managed very nicely for 3 to 6 months depending on the response with neuroral anticoagulant near newer oral anticoagulants as response to therapy so these patients start off with medical therapy this continues with with the oral anticoagulation therapy till such time that the resolution occurs subsequently if they have problems then of course they would require an angiogra a venography 
to see where exactly the blockages are in the vein, iliac vein and then these can subsequently be dilated with balloons and maybe a stent can be placed if the, if the uh, adequate resolution of the thrombus is, uh, has not occurred. So, subsequent to this, these patients require maybe compression bandaging and oral anticoagulation for a period of time. So, this is one of the most prominent venous diseases which we face. Another very important venous disease which we face, which again is a disease of the younger adults, people again who are sitting in offices and working on desktops for long periods of time, and this is as a result of the valvular insufficiency or the venous valvular damage which causes varicose veins. Varicose veins is something which again develops for long periods of standing, long periods of sitting down and lack of exercise. So, these patients develop large varicose veins all along the legs as a result of reflux or essentially the blood flowing back down into the legs when a person is either sitting for a long period of time or standing for a period of time. These varicose veins, they progressively get worse. The venous pressure and the reflux actually causes skin changes along the ankle area and this also results in venous hypertension and actually causes uh, 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 a rupture of the skin along with venous ulceration. When something like this, again, when it occurs, the treatment is to start off with confirmation of the diagnosis by using a venous Doppler examination. This confirms that there is no deep vein thrombosis. There is no, um, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, there is, there, there is no occlusion of the deeper, vein, uh, deeper veins. And of course, the blood is actually refluxing back down into the legs. This can be very easily treated these days with a variety of ablation therapies, the foremost being laser ablation therapy. Then you have radio frequency ablation therapy. Then you have mechanical chemical ablation therapy. Then you have steam ablation and glue ablation. Any of these therapies, depending on the degree and extent of the, of, the, of the varicose veins, this can be done. But the word of caution here that this should all be done under ultrasound guidance. Do not try and do blind procedures because this can actually be very detrimental in the outcomes. So it's better that we use all these therapies under ultrasound guidance so that the varicose veins can be treated adequately and these patients do not develop any ulcers. These patients also require long-term compression, medical compression stockings, which actually give them a lot of support and prevent further recurrences. So this is essentially, in a nutshell, the common vascular venous diseases, varicose veins and deep vein thrombosis, which affect day-to-day -day and modern-day life. Thank you very much.